Hi, I'm Bob Gimlin, and welcome to the second Fan Illustrated episode. This video, and last week's, were my way of making some videos while keeping Fred, my primary illustrator, at full capacity. And it's funny because Fred used to always ask me about deadlines. Deadlines. And I hate that word. What he does is truly art, and they say you can't rush art, and it's been said that life imitates art. So I guess that means you shouldn't rush life. Ever wonder how high a tiger can jump? The answer is as high as it needs to. So when Fred asks me when I need an illustration completed, my answer is always, as long as it takes. When it's finished. So having this series by a different illustrator was my way of increasing production without changing anything on Fred's end. And I want to be totally clear, nothing has happened to Fred, and you'll see more from him very soon. Anyway, this video is a redo of an earlier video of mine, from before I had an illustrator at all. It's about a witness I spoke with who had interactions with an unknown creature in the early 70s, in the swamps of Georgia. I wanted to redo this one because at the time, I had been unable to give this story the treatment it deserves, and because this narrative actually holds a bit of significance for me. It was 2017 when I heard the story firsthand, and I was at, a, let's say, a low point in my enthusiasm for the actual video-making side of all of this. I was beginning to suspect that my channel was a bust, and to be completely honest with you, I was definitely considering not doing any of this anymore. Throwing in the proverbial towel began to sound rather charming, and so I was watching TV when my phone rang for a scheduled call. The witness had a straightforward assuredness about his conclusions. He spoke with certainty, and a particular clarity as he chronicled his experiences. I couldn't tell which I appreciated more, his excitement or his conviction, and I found that attitude rather infectious and I felt my weary spirit reinvigorate. The events, and singular sighting, have led him to believe that a cryptic creature inhabits the Georgian swamps, and I'm inclined to agree with him. The encounters took place between 1972 and 1975, almost 50 years ago, when I was in my early 20s, he said, which is something I can't imagine ever saying. I believe he was 22 in 1972, if I did my math correctly. He is now retired on the East Coast, and he is in good health. As I said, the events occurred in Georgia, south of Williamsburg, where he spent the beginning of his life. The location is wedged between Stephen C. Foster State Park to the north, and to the south lies the John M. Bethia State Forest, which runs all the way into Florida. And then, of course, to the east is the infamous Okefenokee, North America's largest blackwater swamp. Okefenokee alone is almost half a million acres, this immense region is largely impenetrable to all but the most prepared of humans. I know a lot of people seem to think it's fun to pretend that humans have easy access to the entire surface of the earth, but that isn't the case with swamps, and mountains for that matter, which is curious. The witness has fished, backpacked, and hunted all of his life, and this was particularly the case when he was in his twenties. And in over 50 years of entering the wild places of the world, he has only had four inexplicable experiences, and they all took place over a three-year period in a localized area, the passive waters and byways of the Suwannee River. He was alone for all of them, on his bass boat. His bass boat was aluminum, which you didn't see as much back then. It was 7 a.m. and the sun had begun to rise by the time he arrived to the otherwise vacant boat launch. It was 70 degrees outside. Hotter than usual for early April, he said. And already, reptiles prowled the water, leaving sharp angles in their wake. The stream narrowed swiftly. Moving to shore in either direction would have resulted in a trolling motor nightmare. But he liked to be, quote, in the thick of it. That's where you catch the monsters, he said. Of course, at that point, he was talking about bass. He had only cast his line a few times before he came to a tree that partially blocked his way and as he maneuvered around it, he saw what he thought was a piece of garbage wrapped around a branch. And after a double-take through the haze, he realized that the object's identity was not as ordinary as he thought. On a branch the width of his thumb were three, quote, cottonmouths, what I generally call water moccasin. Each one was, quote, tied in a simple overhand knot, tied in identical fashion, right beside each other on the same branch. The heads were facing the water and opposite shore, and the tails were facing the shore from which the tree fell. Two of the cotton mouths were, quote, average to small size, lacking the formidable girth that matured individuals exhibit, and the third was, quote, 
the biggest cottonmouth I'd ever seen or saw since. It was the witness's opinion that they were alive when tied. That's how fresh they appeared. They didn't stink, and therefore hadn't been there long. The longer he looked at it, the stranger it became, and the stranger it became, the longer he looked. He snapped the branch from its adjoining limb, careful not to jostle the display, and perhaps encourage a reflexive bite from the bound vipers. The snakes were unbroken, not a single bruise cut, break, or blood drop between them, yet they were tied so securely that they seemed to have the same fluidity of rope, or hose, as if every single vertebra was identically dislocated. He found this utterly perplexing. They were tied so securely that they were unable to break the bonds of their own cord, and that they couldn't wriggle free, or apparently breathe. But he maintains that the snakes must have been stunned or sedated in some way, as the venom of a cottonmouth is nothing to take lightly. The largest had the tail end of a partially digested fish sticking out of its mouth, as snakes will regurgitate their last meal in times of stress to aid in escape. One of the two smaller snakes was still writhing in a ghastly bid to swallow itself. The snake was no doubt dead, but a snake's neural response can linger long after respiration fails. Throughout the course of our conversation, the witness referred to the display as, quote, art. When I questioned him on the use of the word art, he replied, that's really what it was. It was the only thing I could think to call it. He grew up catching rat snakes as a boy. He even kept a corn snake as a pet for a number of years, so he was familiar with snakes. And yet, he had no idea how the snakes were, quote, tied so snug. There was no apparent injury, nothing conflictingly bent, bruised, or broken. Over forty-five years had passed since he found the artifact, and I still heard his voice thick with wonder. It was obvious to me that he had found something very unique, something that had stuck with him. Perhaps his gaze met the reptile's littlest eyes when he realized that the snakes had to have been tied to the branch on the spot. There were too many sticks forking off the branch to loop them, and the light film of pond scum on the water's surface was undisturbed ahead of him, and the path his boat had parted had not even begun to close. He guessed that no one had been down this way for at least six hours leaving the chilling possibility that there was no boat, and that whoever had done this came out of the surrounding woods and into the water. He said if there was no boat involved in the placement of the snakes, then whoever did it was treading water, unless they were very, very tall. At this point, the snake tire was still a someone, not a something. And to me, it seems that the logistics of it all is what really freaked him out. He said that for some reason, he had the visual of a very tall man, waiting out there in the night, hooded and cloaked, using oversized yet dexterous fingers to tie poisonous snakes to a branch for reasons that are psychotic at best and diabolical at worst. Perhaps the tall man used a torch, or perhaps his eyes were not human enough to require extra light in the darkness and danger of the swamp. Of course, even at the time, he thought that was silly, and yet that was about the only conclusion he could come to. Some very tall man wading out into the swamp, for the sole purpose of nodding stunned or freshly dispatched snakes into no particular place. And understandably, that visual caused him to grow uneasy, which culminated into a mix of fear and disgust, and in that moment of revulsion, he dropped the snakes into the water, and the snakes were swallowed by the black murk. Now why would you do that? I asked. With a shaky laugh, he said, Jesus, I just didn't want to look at it anymore. I asked if he regretted dumping the snakes. He said, no, what was I going to do with three dead snakes? Though he said that if it happened in modern times, quote, I would have taken its picture. And though he didn't mind the fact that he dropped the snakes for evidence-related reasons, he did, in fact, regret dropping the snakes for a different reason altogether. He thought that perhaps disturbing the artifact hadn't been wise because it occurred to him just how much time effort, and risk had gone into creating the art, and he feared the artist may not be thrilled about its desecration. He scrutinized the area for anything else out of place. He said he felt like the swamp itself was mad at him. He felt watched and decided to call it a day. That evening, he told a bartender about the find. She said, yeah, everyone's got a story of spooky stuff happening out there. She didn't seem surprised at all, but you know, it takes a lot to surprise a good bartender these days. 
The very next day, he got onto the water, a little later this time because you know how it goes. His work schedule would grow demanding soon, and he wanted to get as much time on the water as he could. His curiosity insisted upon it, and since finding the artifact the day prior, fishing had become merely a side quest. It had rained that night, and the waterways had widened a bit, making the going faster. He wasn't the only one on the water that day. He recalls a duck boat, a pair of canoers, and a starcraft that he envied. He trolled to the fallen tree, and the branch of the art. Nothing was out of the ordinary. The uneasiness was still there, he said, but he was the only one on the water who seemed to feel it. It was a sunny day, and spring was already flirting with summer. Years before these occurrences, in the witness's youth, he claimed to have hooked but failed to land a bowfin that he claimed was every bit of fifteen pounds, which in the seventies would have been a record-breaking specimen. This environment was exactly like where he almost caught the one that got away. So he began casting his lure beside the grass, and pulling it in, like a struggling wayward minnow. Bowfin are ambush predators. They orient themselves, close to their prey, and then they strike. He liked Bowfin because of their explosive hits, and rod-bending staying power. They don't let go, and they don't give up, he said. He had no luck with Bowfin, but lots of attention from bass, who were more interested in escorting the lure rather than biting it. Insects chirped, frogs croaked, there was no wind to stir the grass, the water was still, but then the stillness broke. The witness didn't see it go up, but he saw it come down. A rock hit the water behind his boat. The impact was so close that it misted his face, and drops broke on the brim of his hat like rain. He went still, no trolling motor, listening and waiting, but it was again completely placid, as if the water tension hadn't been broken at all, just bugs and frogs. He saw the stone come straight down, as opposed to from the sides. He described it in size and shape to a gallon of milk. A gallon of milk weighs about eight and a half pounds, and rock, roughly speaking, is about two and a half times heavier than milk, meaning the rock was every bit of twenty pounds, according to my math. And he was obviously disturbed by, quote, whatever, see it's a whatever now, would be strong enough to arc such a weighty projectile, but what disturbed him more was that it didn't do anything. It was still there. Sometimes the scariest thing that can happen is nothing, ask Lovecraft, Hitchcock, or Shyamalan. The rock thrower, at an absolute minimum, would have been in ankle-deep water among the grasses. Firm earth was too far away for anything to have been able to launch a rock. And even if it could have launched the stone from dry earth, he doubted it would have been able to do so with any accuracy. He said that as the boat stopped rocking, it was quiet enough to perceive a noise as subtle as a frog rising for a breath. He easily would have heard anything sizable moving through the marsh, yet he heard nothing. It was holding its position. It was still there. The witness could only conclude that a creature of considerable strength was literally a stone's throw away. Motionless, crouched, quiet, and obviously confident in its concealment. The witness had a thirty-eight special in a red toolbox he used for tackle. It wasn't for animals. He was raised not to fear animals, and in turn, they fear you. But he was afraid that day. After floating in silence for half an hour, certain that he was being watched, he turned around. On his way back to the launch, he passed a woman in a canoe who was heading to where he had been. He considered warning her, but had no idea what he would say. And I want to note, when he told me about the snakes, the subject was a whoever. During the stone throw incident, the subject became a whatever. He returned regularly, but had no more odd experiences for two years. Not until the summer of 1974. And even two years of nothing failed to deter his curiosity, and the memory of the snakes and the rock still lingered in his mind. He was six miles upriver from the snake and four miles upriver from the rock. Nearing the border of Stephen C. Foster Park, he crossed paths with a large, long dead tree that jutted over the water from the bank of the river. It was partially buried in the sloping bank and had clearly been there for a long time, smoothed and bleached by the elements. The tree suspended over an uncharacteristically smooth substrate of sand and mud. 
Our witness was aware of alligator slides, and he was always on the lookout for sign of the elusive 15 or 20 footers you often hear about but never actually see for yourself. That's why he scanned the shoreline anyway, and that's when he saw unusual alligator tracks. He said the alligator that made the tracks was probably between five and six feet long, certainly not large by alligator standards, but still a formidable animal. The tracks indicated that the alligator was dragged out of the water by its haunches, as there were no tracks from the hind feet, which presumably were held too high for the claws to gain purchase. Only the four claws left tracks, and they dug into the mud, trying to pull itself back into the water to no effect. He said there were also indentations from where the reptile's snout bashed into the mud, presumably in an unsuccessful attempt to strike behind at its attacker. Other than those of wading birds, these were the only prints present. The witness concluded that a creature shimmied onto the log to do some fishing that night. It seems as though whatever grabbed the hapless reptile had a reach of over four feet, longer if the alligator had been submerged when it was grabbed. The creature then must have reversed it down the log, pulling its prey all the way to firm earth at the end of the trunk before dismounting, and continuing on dry land with thick ground cover. The alligator was grabbed by the haunches, from above, pulled out of the water. It had been unable to drag itself back in, and unable to deter its assailant. He said the log would have been ideal for a spear fisherman who didn't want to get wet. And of course, ideal for something that had no intention of writing its tracks on the parchment of mud. I asked why he didn't pull up to the shore to investigate. He said he didn't want to get all muddy, and that he would have sunk deep. He said he had a suspicion that there would be nothing to find anyway. I asked why he didn't seem to have an interest in documenting any of this. He said that he wasn't out to prove anything to anyone, he was just curious, which is boss-level talk as far as I'm concerned. He also noted that he likely wouldn't have given the tracks a second thought, were he not already cognizant of unusual activity in the area. His final encounter occurred late, in the summer of 75. He had to be at work by 4.30 in the morning, so on his days off, it was not unusual for him to be up long before the sun. He said that this was still back in the day, before every entry had a gate, and every gate posted hours of operation. The wilderness doesn't have hours of operation, he said. The sun had just begun to pierce the wounded night sky, leaving an arterial hemorrhage of red in the distance. It was dark, but not too dark to see. At first he used the motor, but its sound was explosive in the quietness, so he switched to the trolling motor up front. He had just made it beyond where he had found the snakes where the stream opens up into grass and lilies, when without warning, he heard an explosive crash through the water. The frenetic splashing was accompanied by deep and low noises. He still isn't sure if they were vocalizations or the suction sound of a flat foot sucking through mud. He was about 90 feet away from the source of the commotion. He saw it through the haze, like smoke on the water. The figure was upright, accelerating into the brush. He described it as wider than a refrigerator, the color of corrugated cardboard, though he said it appeared darker than it probably was due to the pre-sunrise shade of the cypress swamp. He only saw it for a second or so before it cleared the water, leapt the bank, and was out of sight behind grass and trees. But he could hear it for a lot longer than he could see it. The creature made it to dry land in what the witness says was no more than five bounds, and about forty feet. Then the witness does what I probably wouldn't have done. He steered straight for the grass he saw the creature take off from, and began to remove his shoes and socks. From the bottom of his toolbox, he drew his flashlight and pistol, which since the rock-throwing incident had matured from a 38 to a 44. When the boat could go no further, he entered the knee-deep water that shallowed with every step. He tried to recreate the creature's path, but finding tracks proved impossible. The swamp sucked up every footfall, and the surface was impenetrably black more likely to reflect the trees above than depict the mud beneath the ink. You'd sink deeper if you stood still, he said. He had a pretty good idea where the creature made landfall, but he had no direction other than that. He said the grass was so dense and the bank was so high that even getting up to firm earth would have been impossible for him with his hands full. Yet the creature hadn't been hindered by the bank any more than it had been by the water. And though he couldn't tell exactly where it made dry land, he said it must have jumped the distance, 
because the mud of the shore was undisturbed. The water steamed like smoke. He said, quote, A tracker probably would have found something, but nothing looked different to me. He would routinely frequent the area for over five years, until the early 80s, at which point he moved out of state. But he would continue his passion for the outdoors in the Northeast, and later, with regular trips to Florida. But he has had no more unordinary occurrences since 1975, in Georgia. Okay, so what does it mean? I asked him what he thought of the three knotted snakes, if he believed that they had any meaning. He said he felt that the snakes, or art, were some kind of retribution for one of the alleged creatures being bitten by a venomous snake, as if to send a message, like how through much of human history, warnings were a bit more impactful than they seem to be today. And I certainly think that's possible, though it isn't my opinion. I think too much energy was spent on the creation of the display for it to be directed toward something that couldn't perceive its meaning. I don't think the message can be aimed at snakes. Whatever these creatures may be, if they in fact exist, then they certainly understand that snakes don't have the depth of intelligence to perceive such meaning. To me, the interpretation of the snakes comes down to one major question, and that question is, who was the intended audience? All art, in theory, is a message to the viewer. So the question really is, was it meant for others of its kind, or for humans? Well, the snakes were displayed on a waterway that was used by humans with relative frequency. And who knows, perhaps the tree they were tied to didn't fall to block the path on its own. So what is the message to a human observer? Well, it says I'm dexterous, I do things that are strange, I'm willing to do things that are dangerous, I'm competent, and if you're seeing this, I can get to where you are. Which is creepy. Very creepy. And historically, such a sign would prove more than sufficient to get an area labeled as haunted or cursed. And in the more superstitious days, that likely would be an efficient way to reduce human presence on said turf. And that ties into a suspicion I've had for many years. A suspicion that I find rather mind-boggling. Frankly, I think it is intriguing to consider that there may, in fact, exist a species that has a survival mechanism that specifically functions to appear creepy. Wouldn't that be something? In the not-too-distant past, when people were far more superstitious than they are today, screaming in the woods, objects being hurled by unseen throwers, and unhuman-like things created by human-like hands were to be avoided at all costs, which means it wasn't really superstition at all. And it depends on how far back in the day you want to go. Perhaps there was a time when people had some awareness of giants. And perhaps that was a time when those alleged giants were not as cautious as they may be today. So if the snakes were displayed on that waterway for humans to see, then I'll leave their meaning to your interpretation. I think it's more likely that the snakes were a message to others of its kind. These creatures would constantly be on the lookout for venomous snakes. Scanning for this distinct pattern, and others like it, would be second nature to them, constant and habitual, even though the snake's pattern is insidiously camouflaged. The designs likely stick out to them as profoundly as bright colors do to us, which bodes well for the degree of intelligence and environmental awareness that these creatures must possess in order to remain elusive. So I think that such a creature may use snakes, specifically venomous snakes, as markers of some sort, or signals of some kind because that pattern may be as apparent to them as a bright red stop sign is to us. Basically, if a creature sees this display, they know that it can only mean that others of their kind have been through recently. Perhaps it serves as a marker to indicate different turfs. And like I think I said, perhaps the tree didn't fall on its own. So if the snakes were a message to others of the artist's kind, what was the message? What does it mean? Obviously, I can only speculate as to what this may mean to an alleged intelligent cryptid, but I do think some reasonable assumptions can be made about this unreasonable situation. I think the display can safely be interpreted as saying, Look what I can do. I'm clever enough to accomplish this, but also bold enough to bother. And then if you want to get even more specific, I guess it indicates that the art creator has spare time and resources on its hands. Obviously, it's in the advantageous position to be able to turn away protein. And also, obviously, the art maker isn't spending all of its time foraging, hiding, or fleeing. Which, if the alleged creatures exist in areas of human habitation, they must spend a great deal of time with. B. 
because this display, or art, whatever you want to call it, this would take time to create, and it took practice to perfect, not only the elaborate composition of the knots, but the very action of catching the snakes, and not only catching them, but catching three of them in a quick enough time frame for the others not to spoil, and then on top of that, the action of catching the snakes without brutalizing them, or without any signs of injury, because each snake was in perfect condition, aside from their unnatural articulation. To the witness, and to myself too, I suppose, this indicates that the snakes were at most stunned for the duration of the time that they were with the art maker, meaning the artist was walking around with one, two, and then finally three, at best half-dead, venomous snakes. Like I think I already said, the witness was taken aback by the logistics of it all, and at the time, he was contemplating how difficult this would be for an equipped human, let alone something that totally functions within the confines of the natural world. This display says that the artist is bold, and has spare time on its hands. It's confident enough to take risks. It's not difficult to imagine why that may be quite intimidating to a newcomer in the area. In short, if you're a Bigfoot and you find this, it's a pretty good guess that the Bigfoot that made it is not to be messed with lightly. Unless, of course, a newcomer may perceive this as an obvious bluff, because why would a true Alpha Chad Bigfoot waste time making snake threats if it was truly confident in its ability to beat the snot out of an opponent? And it's weird because that sounds like I'm anthropomorphizing, which is attributing human characteristics onto non-human things. But perhaps in this case, anthropomorphizing is quite appropriate. How could it not be? Or perhaps, maybe the meaning is in fact in the witness's immediate interpretation, in his knee-jerk response, his gut reaction, Maybe it was just art. We know so little about what motivates us. How could we know anything about what motivates them? Artists are a strange breed, after all. Perhaps there was some adult Bigfoot out there, chastising his son for wasting time with nope ropes and danger noodles, when he should be practicing quickly walking away like his sister. If these alleged creatures are as similar to you and I as is so often claimed, then maybe the art was created for no other purpose than for the creator's pleasure. But then why would it be constructed at a frequently used waterway? Would be anyone's guess. Unless the artist wanted to low-key show off. Which honestly, isn't an unreasonable assumption if you're to consider all the assumptions that led to that conclusion in the first place. I find it fascinating that the snakes were looped around a branch that wouldn't allow for them to have simply been slipped through. They were tied there on the spot. Something tall and cunning stood there. In the dead of night according to the witness at least. When I first heard this report years ago, I thought the meaning of the snakes was loud and clear, for both humans and the creatures, but I'm not so sure now. Humans are weird. So are great apes. Why should these creatures be any exception? As for the rock incident, it was his assumption that the rock must have been thrown underhand. He didn't see it in the air for any more than a fraction of a second before it was totally submerged so he didn't really see its trajectory, but he said that the water towered at such a perfect right angle with the water, perpendicular with the surface, that he thinks it must have plummeted straight down, though he admitted that the direction of the displaced water has as much to do with the projectile's trajectory as with the shape of the projectile itself. But it was his opinion that it must have come more or less straight down, which suggests a sloping arc, which to him suggested an underhand toss. And I can't help but notice that if we're to accept the stereotypical Bigfoot sighting, the Patterson creature type, then we're seeing a shoulder assembly that is probably too muscularly and structurally resistant to allow for precision overhand throwing. Just like chimps, actually. But of course, the chimp's upper body is configured that way because of the repetitious muscular development that accompanies their quadrupedal locomotion. So the presumption with the alleged Bigfoot-type creatures is that the musculature in the upper body is pronounced to build inertia to assist in walking, much like how figure skaters pump their arms. So the difference, I suppose, is that a chimp actually makes contact with the ground using its arms, while the alleged creatures simply use their arms to throw their weight around to go with the flow of gravity. Because if we're to believe the reports, they consist of an awful lot of mass. But as for the meaning of the rock throw, well, again, I feel it's a fallacy to assume to understand such a creature's motivations, but the action of throwing such a heavy rock over such a long range seems to say, I know where you are, you don't know where I am, and I'm very strong. 
Is such a maneuver designed to give away its nature? Or does it just throw rocks? Or why not both? Remember, if any of this is to be believed, then we're talking about an intelligence that we probably can't even begin to understand until after the fact. Until after a brain is on a slab, or a beast is in a cage. Which has become the sad irony of many researchers' lives. I don't think anyone who spends any time on this subject really wants that. As for the alligator, the witness didn't seem all that surprised by the alligator find. After the snakes, and specifically after the rock, he had grown convinced of capable and intelligent creatures living out there, and he knew they had to eat, and probably eat a lot, but I'm not convinced that this was merely predatory activity. The southeastern conifer forests in Cypress Swamp Basin, coupled with the evergreen oak forests of the higher regions, provide more than enough low-risk calories to sustain large creatures. Going after an alligator must have some meaning, which seems likely, because most things mean stuff. Craig Stanford is a professor of biological sciences and anthropology at the University of Southern California. He asserts that meat is used by chimpanzee with, quote, intentional nepotism and strategy to strengthen social bonds with some individuals, and just as importantly, damage bonds among others. Meat holds great significance in non-human primates as well as human primates, so a cryptid of this description must be no exception. Catching this was not merely predatory. It meant something. Just like the snakes. Though the witness insists that alligators are surprisingly harmless if you know what you're doing. And I agree in theory, but not necessarily in practice. But I should mention, he found the snake ordeal far more impressive than the alligator find. As for the sighting, his final encounter, he knows what he saw. He only saw it for a moment as it exploded through the gloom and haze. But he saw enough to know. What else could it be, he said. It was massive, upright, moved in bounds, and covered a space in a second that took him over a minute to tiptoe through. I asked if he often saw other wildlife. He said that he had seen bear multiple times, and that he often saw deer, otter, raccoon, beaver, hogs, and of course reptiles. He honestly enough said that in some 25 years of living there, he'd never witnessed a wild panther, even though many claim to have. I too have never seen a mountain lion in the wild. I asked if we can rule out a hoax. He thought this was funny. He said hoax what? If it was a hoax, they sure didn't want anyone to see it. I asked the witness if he had asked other people in the area about strange encounters. He said he did, but they were mostly, quote, ghost stories. Which again, is curious considering how many of these occurrences may be interpreted. I would guess that such a creature would have innumerable ways of interacting with humans, and almost none of those ways would include showing themselves. And I would guess that the lion's share of interactions give no indication that such a creature is responsible for them in the first place. I asked if he regretted leaving the area, essentially abandoning a treasure trove of informational and perhaps literal wealth. He said no, he has a wife, and children who now have children themselves, complete with dogs and white picket fences all around, and he doesn't believe that would have been possible if he dedicated his life to monster hunting in a swamp. He said this is kind of an all-or-nothing affair. And I know what he means. In redoing this video, I had to watch it. Which was cathartic. I think. Yeah. Cathartic. I made the first video just a month short of three years ago, at the moment I'm working on this. And I'm not much of a look-backer. I don't like to watch my old stuff. I tend to have a proclivity towards retrospective contemplation. But honestly, I try to fight it, because it never does me any good. No one ever finds what they're looking for back there anyway. I just mean to say that it's hard for me to look at my videos without getting the chronological heebie-jeebies that so often accompany the passage of time. Plus, you might be the same way, but I can't stand the sound of my own voice. A viewer can watch all my videos in a couple days, but to me it's five years of progression. And I know it's progression to many of you too who have been with me for a while. Because not only has my ability to actually create the video itself changed, but my thoughts on things have also progressed. And part of me wants to start redoing all of my old videos, and take the old ones down. But I think representing the progression of time is useful in itself, for many reasons. I know I only spoke with the witness on the phone, and exchanged some emails, but I really don't think he was lying to me. I think he is quite intelligent. 
and he struck me as secure, with a confidence that I can only hope comes with age. I think he is a keen observer, and I think he relayed a series of incidents from the 1970s that have challenged his perceptions for about 50 years. I can't even imagine that. I'm gobsmacked by five years, and this man has remained resolute in his conviction for 50, which is amazing to me. Anyway, and as always, thanks an awful lot for listening.